Please turn in the Word of God to Revelation chapter 20. Two weeks ago, we studied verses 1 through 3, verses 7 through 10. I'd like to read that passage, make a few comments along the way, and then come to our text, which is Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. There are some remarkably solemn words. I think at one of our consistory meetings, if I remember, I think I read this to the brethren. This uh, is the only passage that I can think of in the Word of God where this warning is given. Remember, John wrote this in Greek. Every word from God. I don't think there's any other book that says this. Let me direct your thoughts before we come to Revelation 20 to that very end of the book, Revelation 22, and notice with me verses 18 and 19. This is a statement which should scare the wits out of a heretic John, as he writes, says, he's just written this book in Greek, and he says, For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. I can see why God thought necessary to write that, particularly the doctrine, as you can see from the title, of the study today, the destiny of the reprobate. Because this is the most difficult doctrine taught in Holy Scripture. It is, no question. And why someone would manipulate the text, twist it, and say, I don't believe it, and cross things out. I could see why God would give this warning. But we come then to our scripture reading, and it's Revelation 20. And we already expounded this. It's up on the church website if you're interested to hear that. Revelation 20, verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who was called the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, He must be released for a little while. You remember the purpose of him being cast into the bottomless pit. It is stated there in verse 3, so that he should deceive the nations no more. Satan right now is, beloved, extremely active. He is alive and well on planet Earth, as one writer wrote a book to that effect, and that is true. Blinding the mind, 2 Corinthians 4, taking the gospel seed and snatching it out so that people don't even understand the gospel. He is so active. His activity (coughs) will cease. Dr. Kuiper, you have that 
selection of quotations. Remember we looked at this two weeks ago. He draws attention in sentence three to the fact that he is shorn of his power. He is doomed to impotency and to impress it on all hearts what wondrous grace God still imparts to the children of men. You have an opportunity. God gives where there's no satanic involvement in the lives of people. It's been going on since Genesis 3. It's going to stop. That's what you call grace. An opportunity is given with no devil, no Satan to get in the way. It's just you and the gospel. And it's not going to go well for many. We drop down to verse 7. Satan, you remember, is going to bring cohesive leadership to those who failed to seize the day. And there are many today, even today, who fail to seize the day. Today, right now, is the opportunity to be saved. And so many fail to seize the day. And You know, everybody gets their last opportunity. Eventually, everybody dies, which means you have to seize the day. This could be your last opportunity. But so many don't seize the opportunity. That's what's going to happen. We're in verse 7. Now, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations, which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. Now, this, is, this has to be one of the most striking statements. Satan is bound. He's not active. And notice the number of rebels that will be here on this earth. whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breath of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints at the beloved city. And this statement, this happened in the Old Testament, in the days of Elijah. It'll happen again. He says, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. These people are vaporized. They're gone. Their bodies are gone. Abraham Kuyper in the second quote, and I've underlined a number of statements, and you can read the whole quote later, but you know, just the things I underline. The unholy mass of people, unholy powers, the hostile army, these hordes, these countless hordes. You and I must have a philosophy of realism about life in this world. Jesus urges everyone. Matthew 7, 13, enter by the narrow gate. But he says, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Matthew 7, 14, he comes on to say that there will be few who will be saved. Now that's Jesus, our Savior, the Lord, who is God, who is speaking. Yes, we are into evangelism. Our brothers fully into evangelism. Reverend Stetler. We are too. But we have to have a philosophy of realism. Again, many are on the broad road that leads to destruction. Few will be saved, comparatively speaking. Jesus Christ 
says that. It's a sober thought. It is. But he is our Savior. He is God. And you and I submit to whatever Jesus Christ says. He speaks truth. Truth. That's reality. But we seek to save God's elect. And they will be saved. Every last one. None will be lost. So you've got the balance. This is how scripture is laid out. Well, we looked at Revelation 20.10. This is the devil where he ends up. He's not the first person there. We looked at that last time. Remember, the Antichrist is there first, who's a man, and the false prophet is there secondly. Those two have, are there, and Satan then joins them, the unholy triad. Note verse 10. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. You notice point three there on your outline from this whole series. We looked at all of the degradations. Several sermons under point three. This is the, his final place. There's no further degradation after this. This is where he ends up. He's not there yet. He will be there. But what about the devil's children? <clears throat> he does have children, John 8, 44. You are of your father, the devil, Jesus said. What about, if you look at your outline for a second, and you may hopefully remember those sermons, those studies on point number two, the character of the children of the devil. We looked at point one the vices and the sins that are in the devil, and then they are found in his children. And remember, it's the exact same things. The exact same things. Maxed out of the devil. Yeah, it's a black hole of iniquity. But the same seeds are there in his children. What happens to them? So today we develop point three, D. Satan and his children will be thrown into the lake of fire. Notice with me in the utter clarity of Jesus in Matthew 25, you have it there, it's the third biblical, third text. Matthew 25, 31. This is God, this is Jesus, full humanity, the Olivet Discourse, first century, 1900 plus years ago, he sat and he taught. Let's notice what he says. It's on your sheet there, the third quote, Matthew 25, 31. This is the New King James. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, talking about himself and all the holy angels with him, that's an interesting statement because there are seems to be millions of angels. We get that idea in the book of Revelation, myriads and myriads. Then he will sit on the throne of his glory. And he, as you know, verse 33, he separates the sheep, believers, and the goats, unbelievers. In the absolute precision of the text, the apostle Matthew no doubt heard this this is his gospel. Matthew then wrote this under divine inspiration. This is what Jesus said, verse 41. Here are his words. He's speaking about himself. Then he will also say to those on the left hand. And notice how there's an increasing intensity in the words. Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire. It's a reference to Gehenna. Here it is, prepared for the devil and his angels. The same exact place.
We now come to our text. It's Revelation 20, and it's verse 11. John on the island of Patmos, filled with the Holy Spirit, is given this vision of the final thing that's going to happen before the eternal state. That's in Revelation 21 and 22. You say, what is the final thing before eternity? Here it is. Verse 11. He sees Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ himself said in John 5, 22, that the Father judges no one and that the Son of God is the one who judges everyone. This is Jesus, Messiah. Revelation 20, verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it. The road for the unbeliever ends here. You note know that the throne is white, absolute holiness of God, no stains in his justice. God makes no mistakes in justice, unlike human judges and juries at times make mistakes. Not God. The throne is white. And those here are blackened with sin. They don't want to be there. John says, from whose face, see they're looking at Christ. From whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. Again, who is there? Point two. Those who have this diabolical poison in their lives, who embraced it, coddled it, refused to humble themselves and repent. That's who's there. And they don't want to be there. Now this is a fascinating thing that he says in verse 12. You notice how striking this is. He says, and I saw the dead, small and great, standing. That's striking immediately. What do you mean the dead standing? Yes, the dead, those who had been dead, are now standing before God. Unbelievers from the very first, second generation, going way back to the book of Genesis, Cain and others will be there. They've been raised from the dead to face judgment. And you'll note there in this courtroom what John sees. He sees apparently a stack of books. It's in the plural. He says, and books were opened. Everything that these people had done, they thought it was hidden from God and not recorded. It is written by God in books. Every sin is in the books. But here's the, the wonderful thing. Not for those people, but for us who have come to Jesus and have admitted, Lord, I'm a sinner. Please save my poor, miserable soul. Oh, Lord Jesus, save me. Because I'm really bad. Save me. Our name is in this book. He says, and notice it's singular, and another book, singular, was opened, which is the book of life. It's the Lamb's book of life. But these people, their name is not written in that book, those who are there at the great white throne. 
Get a hold of what he's saying here. We're in verse 12. He says, third sentence, and the dead were judged according to their works. See, God is just. That makes sense. That is totally rational and biblical. There are degrees of guilt even among those who are unsaved. You got Hitler and Stalin and Mao Zedong, Genghis Khan, these wretches on one extreme. Not everyone is like that. They're judged according to their works. By the things which were written in the books, the books record everything. Well, how do these dead get there before that throne? Note verse 13. A lot of people have died and been buried at sea. Bodies become atoms through the centuries. Reconstituted by the almighty power of God, which is absolutely no problem. He created the cosmos out of nothing. Genesis 1.1, this is no problem. Now he uses atoms and reconstitutes these people. Their bodies come back together. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. And death, where their bodies were, and Hades, where their souls were. Death and Hades delivered up who were in them. Bodies and souls come back together before the great white throne. They are found guilty. They rejected Christ. The one on the throne, they had no use for him. They lived their own life. They did their own thing. I am an independent, autonomous man or woman. I will live as I please. No thank you, Jesus. I will save myself. I'm the Lord of my own life. I will not bow the knee to you. Yet, yet they will. And so the verdict is guilty. And we come to verse 14. Death, the realm of the bodies. Hades, the realm of the souls. We read that death, these two areas, these two realms, that death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And you know what he says, and this is really, this is the real problem. There is a way of escape from that great war throne. It's in Jesus Christ. That's the escape. Note verse 15. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. There is the escape. Now, there's the vision. Written in the first century, the Apostle John, the holy man of God, filled with the Spirit, divine revelation, and that's what he wrote. Jesus talked about this as well. You note that fourth quote there on your key biblical text sheet, it's the Luke 12 passage. Jesus wants everyone in the world to have a proper doctrine of God. By nature, we tend to tone down the true God and make him in our own image and create our own idol, a God who can't see everything and who is pretty lenient after all, a God with no backbone, a God who's a jellyfish or some kind of a Santa Claus or a friendly grandfather who looks the other way. No. That's an idol. It's not real. Don't live on the basis of imagination. Live on the basis of reality, a 
as Jesus Christ sets forth the truth. So what is the truth? Notice here, you have it there before you, Luke chapter 12, verse 4. This is a wonderful thing you and I hear this morning. How does Jesus uh, relate to you and me? Is it not amazing that he calls us friends? You see, his benevolence that's reaching out to you and me, you and I are sinners. He calls us friends. There's the offer of friendship, but we have to respond. That's how friendship is formed. Two sides. Not just one side. You have to receive it. Notice what he says. And I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. Well, man, that's, that's a striking statement, you have to admit. But if we would see reality properly, indeed we would listen. Listen. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that have no more that they can do. That's it. That's all that person can do. But I will show you whom you should fear. Jesus says this is how it should be with everyone. Now get a hold of this. This is very important for the doctrine of God because so many have a different God than the God of Holy Scripture. This is Jesus, his son, speaking. Fear him who, after he has killed, get a hold of that, first of all. Remember that God killed Uzzah? You remember that? 2 Samuel 6, 7. God killed Herod Agrippa the I. You remember that? Acts 12, 23. There are other people mentioned in Scripture that the true and the living God killed. He says, fear him who after he is killed has power to cast into, and the word is Gehenna in the original. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Well, we've just read about it in Revelation 20, that final scene. And Jesus Christ says, fear God. Again, who is there? Notice I've given you a fifth quote. This is who's there. And this really shows, I don't know how you react about to this teaching, this shows the justice of what happens at the great white throne. Do you stand with God this morning? Be honest. Do you stand with God and his view in what's going to happen? Notice what the writer says in Hebrews 10:28. And anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy in the testimony of two or three witnesses. He's talking about the Mosaic civil law. But now look at this. Those who are there at the great white throne, this would be true of them. He says, of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has, and they've done three things, those people who are there. They've trampled the Son of God underfoot, They've counted the blood of the covenant, a common thing, and, and they have insulted the spirit of grace. They don't respond to the sweet wooings of the spirit as it comes, the spirit comes in the gospel. Listen, that's an insult. To not respond to the Holy Spirit teaching of scriptures that just not respond to major insult to God. That's who's there. Well, there's the, there's the division. 
in um, the human race. There's the realism. I want to conclude, though, because, you know, I'm preaching to believers. And, beloved, you're not going to be there. You're not going to be there. Yeah, we'll stand before Christ at the Bema, judgment seat of Christ. But everyone there is lost at that particular scene. But I want to end now, just read a couple verses, make a couple comments, and we're done. Revelation 21, let's look at this. You say, okay, pastor, where am I going to be? Well, let's, let's listen to John. Revelation 21. Here is his vision. And notice the connection with the book of life, the Lamb's book of life. Revelation 21, verse 22. But I saw no temple in it. He's looking at the holy city, the new Jerusalem. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in his light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gate shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. Now look at this. Get a hold of this. But there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles, causes an abomination or a lie. Who's going to be there? but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Their names are there from eternity. But as believers, think about that. You've come to Jesus. You're here this morning. He's your Savior. Your name. What do you have? Two names, three, four. Some people have four or five names. You know? These long names. Your name is written above. The Lamb's Book of Life. You're going to be in that city. It's eternal life. Note the symbolism of the eternal life. It's in 22.1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal Proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Biblical symbolism. Clear. Beautiful. Water. Flowing. From the throne of God. Eternal life. How do you get it? How are you saved? Drop down to verse 17. I hope the Holy Spirit's working. Whoever's going to hear this message, even this morning or on YouTube, the Holy Spirit gives an invitation. Notice how many invitations are in verse 17. There's an invitation from the Holy Spirit. There's an invitation from the church. There's an invitation from those outside the church who hear the gospel. God is inviting sincerely everyone to come. Here it is, verse 17. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts, come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. There it is. You want eternal life? Is that your desire? The water of life is flowing. Take it. That's what he tells us. Take, reach, take hold of eternal life. It's free. 